Hello there. I'm going to take some time to go over Act 1 um, and just sort of point out some things that are happening. So those of you who might be having some difficulty might be able to come up with some uh, ideas, especially for the annotation portion of it. So um, without further ado, if you look at Act 1, all right, first of all, you want to make sure to note that this is taking place in Scotland. Remember when Macbeth, the actual was Macbeth was alive, was 1000 A.D., OK, so this is even, you know, almost 600 years before Shakespeare. OK, um, so keep that in mind. Um, and it starts as with everything, whenever the witches are coming and this sets the atmosphere here, right here. Thunder, lightning, three witches. You have supernatural, a foreboding, something bad is going to happen. So whenever the witches come on, we get this foreboding. The other thing is always interesting to note is, again, rain, uh, done, one, all right? You have a lot of couplets when the witches are talking and they're casting spells. Keep that in mind. So they're talking and they're meeting and they're saying, hey, when are we going to meet again? And then the hurly-burly when the turmoil, the uproar is over. So they're saying uh, this idea that they'll be back when, you know, everything has happened. Fair is foul and foul is fair. What's good is bad and what's bad is good. So keep that in mind. And that's hovering through the fog and filthy air. Alliteration is great here. There's a lot of alliteration and there's good and there's bad. All right. So they leave. We get to scene two, which is now we have King Duncan. Make a note that along with King Duncan, we have Malcolm and Donald Bain. Malcolm and Donald Bain are King Duncan's sons. So be sure you make a note of that. All right. Um, then they are visited by somebody who has just fought and won the battles. They're fighting on two fronts. You have Macbeth and Macduff on one front. I mean, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Macbeth and Banquo on one front. And you have other fighters on another front. So uh, Malcolm is and Duncan are greeted by a sergeant who's been up at the front, and he's seen what is happening there, okay, in the, in the battle that is going on. And he witnesses brave Macbeth, okay? They're fighting, and remember, they're fighting for the king. So he's witnessing Macbeth, and Macbeth, and this is part of the idea of the Shakespearean tragedy, is Macbeth is viewed as a good person at the beginning. He's constantly, you'll notice, and as you mark along as you go, he's constantly brave Macbeth, noble Macbeth, worthy Macbeth. Keep that in mind. And it shows his bravery and what a warrior he is. Uh, he's disdaining fortune, and there's some personification there, okay, that like fortune is a person. And he goes and he kills somebody. Um, he faced someone and he nor bade him. Farewell to him, till he unseamed him from the nave to the chaps and fixed his head upon our battlements. We see the ruthlessness and how war has was fought back then. So basically, he cuts the person open from their belly button all the way up, um, and then cuts the head off and hangs it uh, on one of the battlements. He puts a stick in the ground, and boom, there's the head. And that's something that they would do. Okay, so this shows you that the type of ferocity. That is there, okay, and ruthlessness. Oh, valiant cousin, worthy gentleman. That's about Macbeth, okay. Again, Macbeth is held in high regard. Um, so they're talking, and he keeps talking about how brave Macbeth has been, and how they just, you know, they, no matter the assault, they keep on fighting, and they win the battle, okay. And they've uh, another important part, this battleground where Macbeth, and Banquo had been fighting and they, you know, keep Scotland and they win this battle is alluded to as another Golgotha. This is an important allusion. OK, that is the site of Christ's crucifixion. They're saying that this battle is as important or equating it with the idea of Christ's crucifixion. OK, so um, after that, uh, you know, Duncan's like, go ahead, get attended. And then Malcolm comes and Lennox comes to talk to them. And, and Lennox and Ross are also, you know, people who come and, and you know, you, you'll see them throughout. Okay. And they talk about how the Thane of Cawdor, the 
previous Dana Cawdor, who was a Dana Cawdor, um, was, was a traitor, most disloyal traitor, the Dana Cawdor, and how he went up against the king, okay? But they didn't win. Victory fell on them. So now this Thane of Cawdor, this is important, is a traitor, and he will no longer be a Thane. Now, Thanes, you had your kings, then you'd have your prince. Thanes were like holding land. Like, say you split, say the United States, you would have the president, and a Thane would be like, almost like the governor. There's a governor of Rhode Island, a governor of Texas, a governor of Ohio. That would be like sort of your Thane. You'd have an area of land. Okay, in which the king would give them. And there are certain areas that are better. If you look at the United States, some people might would think certain areas or certain states uh, you know, of the country are better than uh, to have than others. So sort of view it that way. So he's happy that this has happened. And then in scene two, we have the witches. They get back together and they're talking and we see their ruthlessness. The first witch talks about a sailor's wife had ch chestnuts in her lap. She was eating it. And, you know, the, the witch goes, give me, and expecting the, you know, first the sailor's wife to give them to her. But, the, of course, the sailor's wife like, no, I'm not going to give you my chestnuts. Well, because the witch now is upset at this person, she is going to bewitch the sailor so that he will not be able to sleep anymore. And this idea of sleep is an important motif Keep that in mind, okay? That's also a motif, the motif of sleep. So I, you know, I should have put that on here with my motifs. I did try to put, uh, identify those as we go. But that motif of sleep is very important. So keep that in mind, okay? And then all of a sudden, drama, drum, Macbeth does come. And then, they, again, you have your couplets, hand, land, uh, mind, nine, all right? So they have these couplets as they're talking a lot of times. Macbeth comes and he says, also, so foul and fair a day I have not seen. So he's like, again, what's, it's, it's a foul day because of the weather and all, everything that's horrible. It's a fair day because we won. Okay. So that's what he's talking about when he puts, it says, so foul and fair day. Um, then they come across, across these witches and they're like, who are you? What are you? And speak if you can. Now we have these important predictions that they make. First of all, they know somehow that Macbeth is the Thane of Gloms. And then they say, hail to thee, Thane of Cawdor, to Macbeth. Macbeth does not know. This is that dramatic irony. And if you want to go back to when the Thane of Cawdor is, when, when Mac, oh, back here, um, they say, you know, that the king said he's going to give the Thane of Cawdor here. No more the Thane of Cawdor should receive our bosom interest. Go pronounce his present death, and with his formal title, greet Macbeth. So Macbeth is saying to Cawdor, this, though, is some good dramatic irony because Macbeth doesn't know this. We know it, but Macbeth doesn't know this. All right, so that's an important step of dramatic irony. Sorry about that. I should have hit that earlier. Hopefully it doesn't lose you. Okay. Um, and... So after that, then they say, all hail Macbeth, thou shalt be king hereafter. So they give him three sort of predictions, and he's like, oh, okay. And they even say that my noble partner is wrapped. Banquo's like, okay, um, this is sort of crazy. I don't know what's going on here. And then Banquo's like, well, what about me? And so they say, hail, hail, lesser than Macbeth and greater. Not so happy, yet much happier. Thou shalt Get kings, though thou be none. Get kings means have kings in like a line of kings. So his, you know, sons, okay. So, but he would not be a king. So they're like, hail, hail. And they want to stay and, you know, tell him a little bit more. Um, but the witches just vanish. And they just like the bell. All of a sudden, bam. Um, so the earth bubbles and takes them away and they're like well, we'll talk more of this later uh, Lem Ross comes and he tells you know Macbeth about what has happened and they say you know Ross says you know we're going to call thee Thane of Cawdor and Macbeth now is like oh wait I'm Thane of Cawdor okay what can the devils be true so Banquo's sort of taken off guard too because now one of those predictions has happened 
All right. Uh, the Thane of Cawdor lives, Macbeth says. Why do you dress me in borrowed robes? Here's another motif. Uh, the idea of appearance reality. Why are you giving me something that I am not? Okay. This comes through often too. I mean, that's what motifs are, things that they'll keep coming up over and over again. Um, so Angus tells Macbeth, well, you're now Thane of Cawdor because of what, you know, the Thane of Cawdor was a traitor and the king has granted you that. So Macbeth is moving up. Cawdor must be a much better area than what Gloms was. So Macbeth now is Thane of Cawdor too. Gloms and Cawdor. So he's got two together. You know, he's, 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 he's growing. All right. Whenever you see an aside like this, it's similar to the idea of the soliloquy. So the aside, they're speaking out to the audience. Now, others are on stage, but they're either speaking out to the audience or maybe it's just an aside between characters and no one else hears. Same thing in the soliloquy when they're just speaking out to the audience. Okay. Um, in Banquo, you know, in, in Macbeth, they're like, wow, what's going to happen? And even Macbeth even mentions, do you not hope your children shall be king? Okay. Um, Banquo then talks about, uh, you know, okay, well, we're just going to have to watch. And this is an important part here. To win us to our harm, the instruments of darkness tell us truths. Win us with honest trifles to betray in deepest consequence. Hence, should we really be believing witches? They're supposed to be evil. Why would we believe them? And why should we listen to something that is evil? Which is, you know, a good point. So Macbeth doesn't know what to think. He has another aside. He's thinking to himself, could, could this be good? Could this be bad? I don't know what to do. All right. Um, so, and Banquo notices Macbeth over here thinking about things. And Macbeth right now is like, if chance will have me king, why chance may crown me? So he's like, without my stir. So I'm not going to turn do anything to this. Okay. Um, so come what, come what, come may time and hour runs through the roughest day. So he's like, you know what? It's no matter what happens, time keeps moving on. All right. So they're moving on and, you know, going to, um, they now go to forest. They meet there at the palace where Duncan is with Malcolm and Donald Bain. Um, and as they come into this, they tell, they find out that the Thane of Cawdor has been executed right here. Um, and we get a little bit of insight into uh, Duncan here. And he says uh, about the previous Thane of Cawdor, he was a man whom I built an absolute trust. So we get this idea that maybe Duncan's uh, ability to judge character isn't always the greatest. Okay, that comes up. Um, and then there's, a, you know, of course, the Shakespearean tragedy here is Macbeth. He's, you know, a worthiest cousin. So he's always viewed as something very uh, worthy and noble, especially in this act one. And, you know, we have the service and loyalty I owe you, Macbeth tells him, you know, you know his, he's, you know, an honor to do what he has to do for Duncan, okay? Um, so we also, an important plot point here is that the eldest Malcolm, it be, who is Duncan's oldest son, is called the Prince of Cumberland. The Prince of Cumberland then is next in line of the throne. And make, keep in mind from this uh, about where Macbeth has to go, what he has to do in order to become the king. Inverness is where Macbeth's castle is located. So he's like, I'm going to have to, I'm going to, Macbeth's like, I'm going to leave and go to Inverness. All right. So he wants to get there quickly. Okay. And we'll see why soon. Um, the Prince of Cumberland, that is a step for which I must fall down or else overleap. For in my way it lies. Stars hide your fires. Let not light see my black and deep desires. The eye wink at the hand, yet let that be which the eye fears when it is done to see. So he's like, I can kneel like you kneel before a king, or I have to jump over this, the Prince of Cumberland. Um, stars hide your fires. This idea is that, that those fires, that deep and black desires to be king. But in order to be king, he's going to have to get rid of the king. Okay, and keep that in mind. All right. So... Scene five, we are introduced to Lady Macbeth, who first reads a note from Macbeth. 
And then we go into a soliloquy. Remember, Shakespeare is famous for his soliloquies where a character is alone on stage and gives us information. This information will lead to a lot of dramatic irony when we get to soliloquies, okay? Um, and that's an important part of Shakespeare, too. So she reads, what, and, and, and we see the trust that Macbeth has, that he writes this letter to his love, my dearest love. Um, my dearest partner of greatness, we see a great love between these two. Now, it might not be up to the greatest things, we'll find out, but there seems to be a very uh, a, a real love and caring there. Now, she's worried that Macbeth is just too kind, that he's not going to be able to do what he has to do in order to become king. All right. Um, the messenger comes, says, you know, Macbeth and the king is coming, and she's happy. She's like, um, oh, this is great news. The king will be here. So now we have another soliloquy. She's alone on stage. And she's basically, this is almost like an evil prayer. She wants to be filled with bad things, okay? To be filled with things so she can do what she needs to do to help Macbeth become the king, all right? Um, you know, make thick my blood, fill me with the dunnest smoke of hell. I want to, you know, be encompassed with this everywhere. And when I have that knife, don't have anything say, hold, hold me back. I want to be able to stab that knife where it goes, go, where it needs to go, which is King Duncan, you know. So she is calling this on her and then Macbeth comes in. All right. And she's happy to see him. And he's like, my dearest love. Again, we see that they, there's a, a good relationship between them. Um, and, you know, he's like, Duncan comes here tonight. And once it goes hence, tomorrow as he purposes. Now, Macbeth is not really thinking. I mean, it's there in his mind, but he's not bringing it up that, you know, we could kill him. Lady Macbeth, though, oh, no, shall son, oh, never shall son that morrow see. So the king is not making it out of the castle is what she's basically saying. Um, and then this idea of appearance reality. Your face, my thing, is a book where men may read strange matter. So this idea of appearance and reality also comes into play, this underlined part here. I'm going to underline that. All right, so keep that in mind as you're reading it, okay? I'm going to write this in. Um, yeah. Now, there are other things as we're going through, but make sure you're putting other ideas down. So that idea, look like the innocent flower, but be the serpent under it, all right? So act like you're innocent, like nothing's wrong, but be ready to attack. So like a walking along, oh, beautiful flower, I'm going to pick it up, and then bam, you're the serpent. You're going to, you know, bite, poison, do what you have to do, okay? Um, Macbeth's like, okay, we'll speak further about this. And she's like, yes, leave all the rest to me. So we can only guess that they go and they do speak further. And we'll so, touch on that later, okay? They go up to the castle, Duncan's there with Banquo, um, looking at everything, and He's like, see, see, our honored hostess, the love that follows you, follows us sometimes is our trouble, uh, which still we think as love. So this idea that, you know, he's very gracious towards her. She also is gracious towards him at your service because appearance, reality, she has to appear. They have to appear, Macbeth and Lady Macbeth, like nothing's wrong. They love the king. And that's the dramatic irony. We know they are plotting to kill the king. Okay, Duncan does not know this. Banquo does not know this. Okay, but we know that they are doing this. All right, hence dramatic irony. I would put that in there. All right, then there's some more here. Look, hey, well, to this home before us, fair and noble hostess, we are your guests tonight. All right, and Lady Macbeth says, oh, you're in our trust. And again, we know that she really is plotting to kill him. All right, and that becomes important. Now, the final scene for this act and in the castle, and we have Macbeth's famous soliloquy. He's out there. People are in the background, but they're not, they can't hear him, so they're really far in the background. He comes off to sort of like the side of the stage. Um, we're only hearing him. No one else is hearing him, and no one else is really around, okay, uh, depending on how they're going to place this. Um, and then he's basically like, if it was done, it's we're done, and we're done quickly. Okay, if we're going to do it, let's do it quickly. And again, the idea of assassination, one of the first times this comes up in, with Shakespeare, and the, Shakespeare is actually credited with 
uh, terming, making that term, that terminology, assassination. So um, he doesn't know if he should do it. And then he gives reasons why. First of all, I am his kinsman and his subject. So this idea that he is related in some form to King Duncan comes out. Also, he's his subject. Okay, King Duncan is a king. All right, so I shouldn't be able to do this. Um, then, as his host, okay, who should, against his murderer, shut the door? So I'm a host. What kind of host kills their guest? That's not good at all. And then this part here, it talks about how good and how well, how loved King Duncan is. So King Duncan is loved by all. So there are three reasons there why he's saying he shouldn't do this. The only thing, and here we go. On vaulting ambition, okay, the only thing they have there is this idea of ambition. So this fatal flaw, all right, comes into play. That's the only reason. So right now he's like, no, I'm not going to do it. But then Lady Macbeth comes and convinces him otherwise. So she uh, um, says, he, he's like, we will proceed no further in this business. He hath honored me of late, and I have bought golden, I have bought golden opinions from all sorts of people, which would be worn now in the newest gloss, not cast aside so soon. He's like, all these people are saying how great I am, and they really are looking up to me. Why would I kill him? And then Lady Macbeth says, you know, where, what happened? You know, were you drunk when we, you know, when you dressed yourself, had a slept since? I, you know, what we're going to do? Have you just forgotten about this? Okay. Um, are you going to live a coward or are you going to do what you need to do? Okay. In order to be a man. And so she starts to prey on this idea of, you know, you, you know, you need to become a man, do what you're supposed to do. And he's like, I, I'll do what a man should do, but no more. Then she comes up with this very interesting uh, monologue here. The beast, what beast was it then that made you break this enterprise with me? So apparently there was a promise made when they said they were going to go and talk some more about this, that they, they were going to do this. When you durst do it, then you were a man. And to be more than what you were, you would be so much more than a man. So she's like, when you fulfill your promise, you're a man. And not only that, you'll be more than a man. All right. Now she says, um, I have given suck and know how tender it is to love the babe that milks me. It could be uh, inferring that they did have children that are no longer around, or at least a child that's no longer around. Okay. Now she's saying that I would, while I was smiling in my face, have plucked my nipple from his boneless gums and dashed the brains out had I so sworn as you have done to do this. So... If she had sworn or made a promise to him that she would kill their baby, and she would do it because it's a promise. All right. And then Macbeth goes, well, if, what if we fail? And she's like, then we fail. But if you're courageous enough, we can do it. And then they hatch the plan. When Duncan's asleep, they're going to get all the, the groomsmen, the, the guards. They're going to get them drunk with wassail and with wine and wassail. Wassail is like a hard cider. And at, when they're passed out, they're going to go in, kill Macbeth, and then they'll frame the guards, okay? And Macbeth is like, whoa, bring forth men, children only. He's like, you're like more of a man than I am, is what he's saying. For thy undaunted metal should compose nothing but males. Um, when we have marked with blood these two sleepy two of his own chamber and use their very daggers, that they have done it. So this motif of blood also keeps coming in too. He, what what does blood symbolize? You know, and think about blood and what it, it means. Okay, as in you know the life of blood. Okay, and uh, so they have now agreed to do this. And here again is that appearance in reality. Okay, um, away and mock the time with fairest show. False face must hide what the false heart. Doth know. So again, more this idea of appearance versus reality. Um, and that's something we're going to continue to touch on in this play. So, so I hope this is helpful. And uh, if you have questions, please again continue to email me and I'll be happy to help you out with that. All right. So uh, thank you.